Welcome to the Sano Genetics Podcast. I'm Patrick, the co-founder and CEO of Sano. Our guest today on the podcast is Dr. Sonia Abraham. She's a researcher at Imperial College in London, and she works on a few different research areas, including arthritis, psoriasis, and ankylosing spondylitis. And her work focuses on something called biological therapies, or they're often called biologics. And she also works on understanding how the gut microbiome might affect how we process these uh, different treatments and our risk for disease. So Sonia, would you mind just starting us off by explaining the main difference between biologics and other types of treatment? Yeah, so, so most um, treatments and therapies today have been sort of chemically derived um, molecules. Um, so things like um, anti-inflammatories, steroids, um, like brufen, um, antibiotics, they're all sort of chemically derived. Um, the biologics are essentially proteins, so the actual matter they're made up of is different. Right. And they target specific overexpressed proteins in seasons. One of the best explanations of biologics I've ever heard is actually. So you work on arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis. Um, is, is your research quite cross-cutting um, or do you um, tend to focus on one more than the other? Yes, the standard interest is psoriatic arthritis. And psoriatic arthritis has been, to date, the Cinderella of the arthritis. So all the sort of big changes came with rheumatoid arthritis, which was the most common um, inflammatory arthritis. And it's in that that biologics first came in and you know, people do really well um, in rheumatoid. Um, and closing spondylitis, there were newer therapies, but now the psoriatic arthritis, um, there's a sort of big advent of new therapies, but um, diagnosis can be sometimes a problem. And because there's a heterogeneity of um, the disease, we don't necessarily know what the best drugs are for the patients for the best subtypes um, and sort of drug discovery has always been you know you try it with one disease and then you try it in another but here you know by using the research that we're doing and understanding the interaction of the microbiome in patients um, we can identify possible mechanisms by which um, the inflammation occurs and by understanding that looking at sort of new targets um, for general drug development, but actually with time, holy grail is to actually say, okay, well, you, your arthritis um, is made up and is triggered by this, this, and this. So let's look at a cocktail of therapies um, that are specifically designed for you and sort of, that, yeah, that grail right. is personalized medicine. So on the on the question of the microbiome, I think that's a, an area that's exploding in terms of research interest. Do you, what, what is it that you're expecting to see or, or hoping to see in some of your microbiome-related research? Yeah, so, so uh, um, I mean, no, you're right. I mean, the microbiome field has suddenly ex exploded, and I think that's really exploded because of techniques of understanding the genes involved in the um, microbes that sit within the body, body of which the majority in the gut. So that's what's transformed the interest and being able to measure it. But what we want to try and do is understand how it relates to disease. So we have a number of hypotheses that we want to try and um, determine and we want to see, you know, is the microbiome in um, somebody with psoriatic arthritis very different to a healthy individual? Um, is that microbiome stable over time or does it change both in patients um, at any time? What are the effects of food on that microbiome? Um, and what does the microbiome do to both the immune cells and what does the microbiome do in terms of producing um, metabolites, so chemicals, which then may drive those immune cells to either be overactive or um, remain inactive or appropriately activated and not hyperactive. Right. Um, so, um, and, and then also sort of in psoriatic arthritis, you know, is that different, the microbiome, to ankylosing spondylitis um, or are there overlaps? 
Right. So I guess the number and abundance of bacteria in, in the gut is so uh, is so dramatic that actually yeah. the, the the proteins and and things that the microbiome put out can cause the body to behave in all sorts of different ways, right? Exactly, um, at possibly different times, and with because I mean, you know, genes are set. Um, the way those genes are expressed can be altered. Um, the way the genes, and, <laughs> and this is called about our own genes, are expressed and altered and interact with the microbiome can change depending on environment, what you eat, other things around you. And we know that sort of, you know, behaviors can also change that as well. So it is huge. Right. What's, what's known about the microbiome in psoriatic arthritis already, or is this kind of un, uncharted territory? Yeah, so, so um, already the, the, I mean, there have been publications showing that there is a difference um, between um, psoriatic arthritis patients and um, healthy volunteers. And it's really not so much about the total number of um, microorganisms, but the balance of them. Right. And it found that there are sort of certain species of bacteria that are more prevalent in the arthritis patients compared to normal uh, people who may have those bacteria. So particular subtypes called bacteroides and firmicutes um, may be more prevalent. Um, now what's not known is, is that just the way that person is? Because right. it's always been taken at one point in time. Or does it change over time? And does it change when that have active disease or when they're in remission? Um, when the disease is inactive, can drugs that you take for the for the arthritis actually change that bacteria to make it more normalised, um, or is it always there that bacteria and we can't change it? Endless number of questions, right? Once you have that baseline established, um, exactly. anything can change exactly. it, right? And exactly. what what do we know? So it sounds like that that study was he healthy people compared to people that have psoriatic arthritis. How much do we know about? Is it about a third of people that have psoriasis will exhibit symptoms of psoriatic arthritis? And and how do we? What do we know about what might distinguish those people? Yep. So that's great question and, and that's just sort of general statistics um, that people um, give. I, th I think it's probably a bit more complicated that right. in that um, it's possibly also genetic background, possibly, yes, the microbiome being affected, but how does that microbiome get affected? Um, at the moment, I don't know of any studies that are actually saying, okay, let's take patients with psoriasis, follow them up and see which ones then get psoriatic arthritis and, you know, take their stool samples right. regularly. But I think that would be something of interest in the future, definitely. Yeah. And see if you can sort of diagnose that when you're going to go on to get psoriatic arthritis by a stool sample. Right. I, I'm aware of some studies that uh, obviously are looking at the genetic differences between um, people who develop psoriatic arthritis and, and um, people who just have uh, psoriasis, but I'm, al I'm also, yeah, I'm also not aware of any that are looking at the, the relationship to the gut microbiome. I'm moving towards the next generation of treatments, do you think that biologics are, are just getting started in terms of their effectiveness, or, or do you think some of, some of your work and others is going to lead to, um, you know, a, yet another generation of, of therapeutics, maybe based on modifying the microbiome, for example? Absolutely, and I think that would be the hope. And it may not be biologics, it may not be the traditional um, sort of chemical entities of medicines. It may be the sort of com complementary use of therapies and of, of medicines and possibly um, altered food, nutritional substance as well to alter that bacteria. Right, um, interesting. So... So, so I think there, you know, there could be a time where, you take, I mean, I'm not saying that medicines are really going to be obsolete, but you take the medicines that are still active or threats, that actually also take nutritional supplements as well. Um, and I suppose the other thing is that, you know, if it, once it gets so refined and we understand about it, if there are subtleties within individuals where 
the traditional therapies are not working, what we can do to sort of manipulate that microbiome to then allow that therapy to work or add in additional things to get that person into remission. So blocking some of the metabolites that that might be the gut could be bacteria producing or targeting right. or, or trying to alter the ratios of those um, micro, microbes. Everyone who has one of these conditions um, comes to learn themselves that they react differently to different foods. Um, mm. And this seems like it could be, th th this could be a, an important piece of the puzzle, right? That those foods change the microbiome and then the microbiome makes, makes the body react in, in all sorts of unpredictable ways. Is that, the, is that the dominant kind of model for this? Yes, and I, I think that there were people sort of too easy to dismiss that, that people would say, oh, yes, I can't eat this or I can eat this. And, you know, the only sort of formal test we do is perhaps celiac screening and gluten enteropathies. But actually, if you talk to more and more people, they do notice subtleties of changes of certain food types and changes in their disease activity, even if it's a little twinge. So right. yeah, there is definitely a relation, not just with microbiome, but those food types, which may perhaps be then interacting with the microbiome to then produce metabolites yeah. and affect the immune cells. It seems like this, this would be a big challenge in some of your studies, isn't it? You're, you're going to collect um, microbiome samples multiple different time points, right? And uh, um, and I guess you do you try to collect information about what people are eating in between, but that seems like hard research, right? You've got a lot of uh, a, a lot of things that are out of your control there. How how people self-report what they're doing, for example, is that yeah, right? Yes. So so, so so what we're doing is we're actually doing food diaries um, just for the week before they come in to give their samples, um, and so we can try and see. Are there any relations to foods that we think to what's in the gut? The first, um, the first sample you take, you can you can ask if people um, if there's some relationship between what they've eaten the week before. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That makes sense. Do you have any um, thoughts or plans? Uh, I mean, we can get futuristic here, but but might there be ways to to get this information throughout the research study so you can not only have it at the beginning but but see if yes. the food people are eating yeah, is changing. Yeah, that would be amazing. I don't know how we could capture that. I mean, it's quite a lot of work so writing every single thing right. that you're eating, but you know, if there's some technologies that can be developed that, yeah, automatically, whatever, you know, open the put in my mouth and <laughs> right. captured. Yeah. My iPhone, just like it pictures it every time. Something in my mouth or something. Yeah, That's something hard, isn't good. it? I've heard some people yeah. suggest that that if if the person doesn't have a family, then you and they use a, a service like Okado to do home delivery, then maybe you uh -huh. could triangulate that information. But of course, you you're assuming they eat everything they've ordered, and but but maybe it's a maybe it's a pilot project for somebody to run just to see if the data is useful at all. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But you want to see what they're actually right. eating rather than ordering. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough one, and and I, I suppose people around all day, so you've got to have some kind of non-invasive or non-intrusive solution. Oh, exactly. But I guess the last question I'd have for you is is looking towards the future, the next five or ten years. What are you, what are you most excited about? Is it a is it this shift from uh, maybe biologic or, or um, chemical intervention to, to better treatments, or is it prevention, or is it really understanding the, these disorders in a lot more um, kind of exquisite detail? What are you most excited about? Yeah, so I think it depends on disease of which modality we're in. So I think something like rheumatoid arthritis got so far in terms of really helping get, get improvements with lots of, lots of therapies. So it's sort of understanding which ones are the right ones for individual patients. And then ultimately now, you know, people aren't as inflamed as they used to be. Um, can we look at preventing it? Whilst psoriatic arthritis, I think, was a little bit behind there. And there are really good therapies working there, but there's still a lot less, say, inventory. So I think new therapies in those. Um, 
there really aren't any sort of definitive blood tests in terms of diagnosing psoriatic arthritis. Right. It's still very much a clinical disease. Um, so, yeah, if there's ways of sort of diagnosing early to treat early, it's not getting severe. Um, but I think, yeah, prevention, but I think there's a lot more way to go right. with prevention at the moment. But it's treating as quickly as possible. Forgive my ignorance on this. The is there a is there a good blood test to diagnose rheumatoid arthritis? Well, it's easier because as well as the clinical symptoms, there are things like rheumatoid factor, anti CCP antibodies. And there's and there's no analog in psoriatic arthritis. That makes sense. Yeah. The last thing I was wondering is so we've been uh, we've been getting ready to start publicizing this study that you're running on the microbiome and psoriatic arthritis and trying to uh, send some participants your way. I was just wondering how many people are you hoping to recruit? Is it hundreds? Is it thousands? What's this? What's the scale of this uh, study? So we're looking to recruiting patients with psoriatic arthritis, 50 patients with um, anglosing spondylitis, um, and 50 healthy controls. And of those psoriatic arthritis patients, um, 50 will just have one time point. Two. Right. Um, and then we're looking with 50 to see how it changes over time, over a period of a month. That's a big experiment. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why we, uh, yeah, trying to get lots of patients in is right. quite challenging. How many do you yeah. have so far? Uh, we've got about, uh, I think, sixty. Six. Okay, great. So 60, yeah. oh, sixty. It can split evenly across all of them, or is one? No, that's very no, 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 More healthy sorry. controls. Yeah. Yes. Um, no, we haven't got hardly any health controls actually. Right. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah. Great. We're well, exciting. <laughs> will be once we get them all in and we analyze everything. Yeah. yeah. The potential is really exciting. Um, what's been amazing is the people have come into it that were a bit really interested in it and participated really well. I actually thought, oh gosh, I'm going to find it very hard to put food diaries and stuff, but they've been very <laughs> diligent yeah. and very motivated and written beautifully. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah. I think, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's such interesting research. <laughs> it's a really interesting discussion. So thanks very much. Yes.